Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Andy Yao and uh, Han for organizing this faculty summit. I am going to talk about computational thinking in the sciences and beyond, given that the theme of this faculty summit is computing and sciences. Um, some of the uh, comments I'm going to be making, um, you, some of you who were here two years ago will have heard them already, but I'm going to use Microsoft Research examples to populate my stories on how computational thinking has already influenced the research agenda of many science disciplines. I will also update you on some of the educational efforts that have been going around the world, including in China, on computational thinking, especially in the K through 12 space, but also at the college level. And I, I'm sure those kinds of updates will interest this particular audience. So I'm going to start with my grand vision. Uh, and my grand vision is that computational thinking will be a fundamental skill used by everyone in the world by the middle of the 21st century. And by fundamental skill, I mean as fundamental as reading, writing, and arithmetic. So wouldn't it be uh, wonderful if we imagined every child learning uh, computer science or computing um, in, in their K through 12 education? Of course, this is an incestuous vision in that computing and computers will enable the spread of computational thinking. Now, this vision has certain implications with respect to the research agenda of many different disciplines. And that's where I'm going to focus on uh, the science disciplines today. But computational thinking has already influenced uh, not just the sciences and engineering fields, but even beyond the, the liberal arts, humanities, um, uh, the social sciences, economics, and so on. But this vision also has implications with respect to education. And because you are faculty at many universities and colleges um, in the Asia Pacific region, it's, I'm sure this vision um, is of interest to you in, in terms of how it will affect the curricula on your campuses and the K through 12 curricula in your countries. So in, I argue that already at the graduate level, computational thinking has pervaded in the ways in which graduate students are trained for the future. Uh, I think the challenge for us in society is what does this vision of mine imply for the K through 12 education space. I wrote a three page article called Computational Thinking in 2006. It's a very easy read. It's a little poetic. Um, but it's one of those articles that you read just before you go to bed uh, to just a, kind of a light reading. Uh, and it is the article that perhaps has um, helped me spread my vision. And so <clears throat> for those of you who have read it and have uh, argued for it, thank you for that. OK. so. In the article, I talk about, I don't really define computational thinking. I say computational thinking is an approach to problem solving, un, um, building systems, and understanding human behavior using concepts from computer science. Um, and of course, since that article, I've been uh, hounded by everyone you know, to come up with a, a formal definition of computational thinking. And I think that's really difficult to do. This is the closest I've come up with. And I um, have help from the community in, in trying to uh, come up with a definition that all of us in computer science can uh, understand. Uh, it still doesn't help people outside of computer science, unfortunately. But I wanted to really focus on the thought processes. Computational thinking is what happens in your head. Um, it's the first thing that happens in your head that then gets translated into something that a machine might uh, be able to execute or a human might be able to execute. So computational thinking, first and foremost, are the thought processes involved in first formulating a problem and solving it. And this is the problem solving part of computational thinking. Problem, uh, computational thinking is an approach to problem solving. But it, in problem solving, 
especially in computer science, just formulating the problem is a step forward. And so part of what I mean by thought processes involved in formulating a problem and expressing its solution is it's two, hand, two parts of problem solving. One is formulating the problem, and the other is solving it. And then I say expressing a solution, because in computer science, we pay a lot of attention to the ways in which we express the solution. In fact, you can argue that many of the designs of many of the programming languages are different ways to express our solutions. Some languages are better at expressing certain kinds of solutions than other languages. Some languages are meant to express higher level solutions than lower level solutions, and so on and so forth. So expression is quite important. And then in such a way that a computer, and I'm very careful to say a computer can be a human or a machine. And in fact, in this day and age, a computer can be a network of humans and machines working together to solve a problem that neither can solve alone. So I'm very careful to include humans in a computer. And then can effectively carry out. The word effectively, of course, is critical here. Um, it's not a, it, it, it is part of what is inherent to why it's computational thinking um, and, and, and not, uh, not just mathematical thinking, for instance. So um, I'd like to talk about computational thinking philosophically as actually complementing and combining mathematical and engineering thinking. Computational thinking certainly draws on mathematics um, as its foundations, because mathematics is the foundations um, for, of computer science from the theoretical aspects of computer science. Um, but, but in computer science, unlike in mathematics, we are actually constrained by the physics of the underlying machine that's going to effectively carry out the solution. Whether that machine is a, a machine that we're familiar with, like a laptop or a mobile device, or whether the machine is a human, and in fact, it's research still to understand the limitations, the computational limitations of a human solving problems. That's partly a part of the whole quest in artificial intelligence, for instance. But unlike in mathematics, you know, we can't for very easily say for all x, p of x, um, because w usually we are constrained, if we're especially talking about this kind of machine, um, we can't W there, we, we end up hitting against the limits of what that x is in terms of representation. Computational thinking also draws on engineering since our systems interact with the real world. So any of our computing devices, any of the software that we um, write, in the end is communicating, interacting with either the physical world or a human being. And so all of our technology uh, interacts with the real world. So it's like any engineered system, like a bridge or a building or any physical, en physical engineered system. It interacts with the real world. And so we have to keep in mind how um, a system that we build in computer science interacts with the real world. But the, the beauty of computer science in, or the secret weapon of computer science in contrast to other engineering disciplines is software. Software really is something special to computer science. And it's in software that we can design worlds that defy the laws of physics and defy the laws of nature. And so it's in software that we can build worlds that let us ex express what, how, how, whatever we can imagine. So we are only limited uh, by our imagination in the kinds of systems, in the kinds of worlds that we can build in computer science. So that's why, this is all philosophical, but that's why I like to think about computational thinking as complementing and combining mathematical and engineering thinking. 
when I talk about computational thinking, I really do mean those thought processes, the ideas, the concepts, the abstractions that computer scientists use uh, on a routine basis. I'm not so focused on the artifacts that um, manifest those abstractions. Uh, so it's not just the software and the hardware uh, that touch our daily lives, but it, it's a, an approach to, to living, an approach to problem solving. And I do think that it is for everyone everywhere. Um, just to be a little more concrete, I, I'm listing here some sample classes of computational concepts. And I'm listing these only to say not that every child has to learn all of these, but I think every child can learn some of these. And I think what's out on the open right now is to figure out collectively as a community what does make sense to teach what concept when. And the reason I list these kinds of concepts, which should be familiar to all of you, is to contrast what I mean by computational thinking and computer literacy. So there are many courses out there that teach how to use Word and Excel and PowerPoint and how to use search engines like Google or Bing. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm also using the term computational thinking to contrast what I mean by, uh, what I mean with computer programming. Computer programming, of course, is a skill that all computer scientists learn and use routinely. But I'm saying that much beyond computer programming, there's more that computer scientists have to add to the thinking skills, to the reasoning ability, to the logical um, analysis that we in computer science do. And I especially don't mean, you know, a course, for instance, that you typically find on a college campus offered to freshmen that's called, you know, Introduction to Your Favorite Programming Language 101. That changes from year to year. It changes from, from decade to decade as programming languages change. Um, and there's more to computer science than teaching just computer programming. So what I want to do is take a step back and look at, from the research perspective, how computational thinking um, has already influenced many different disciplines. And in the spirit of the, the theme of this faculty summit, I'm going to focus on the sciences um, and give you uh, four different examples, two from biology um, and two from the social and economic sciences. So um, I already s gave away uh, my, my usual uh, question, but what I'm going to do is look at one discipline and uh, argue that many different computational methods have already influenced the thinking in that discipline. And at this point, normally I say, you know, what one discipline might that be? But I already gave that away. <laughs> so it's biology. And I think for me, when, what when, it, when it was the sequencing of the human genome, I think it was that breakthrough that when biologists sort of sat up and said, hey, maybe computer scientists have something to bear on the way I, as a biologist, can solve problems in biology. And it was the algorithm that really expedited the sequencing of the human genome. And of course, uh, the, um, the architecture of the uh, 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 arrays of machines that helped as well. But in all these examples in biology, these different computational methods, processes, languages, techniques, and tools have one commonality, and that is the, these methods, languages, tools, and techniques all are useful for explaining the dynamics of processes. And for us in computer science, we use these kinds of tools, techniques, and methods to explain, explain uh, com computational processes and how they interact, whether they're concurrent processes in an operating system or processes in a distributed system uh, or uh, fault-tolerant kinds of systems where you have to worry about reliability. All sorts of different tools, techniques, languages, models that we have invented in computer science all are ways to understand 
the in dynamic interactions between and among processes. So for us, this is kind of bread and butter. But it so happens that these kinds of methods, tools, techniques, and languages um, can be used to explain the dynamics of biological processes. And that's the aha, or that's the dare, or that's the uh, hope. So what I want to do is explain in one uh, example from uh, some work done at Microsoft Research on stem cell prediction. And this is very recent work just published in Science of the Summer. And the idea is to do stem cell prediction. So the problem is a biological problem. And let me first explain it and then show you how a computational tool and method or thinking uh, came to bear to help understand stem cell prediction. So this starts with embryonic stem cells. And embryonic stem cells have two properties that make them special. The first is that they're self-renewing, which means they divide indefinitely. So they, there's always plenty of them. And that's pretty amazing. The second is this notion of pluripotency, which means they can gene generate all adult cell types. So a particular stem cell can eventually um, evolve into a brain cell or a lung cell or a kidney cell. So we understand that. We don't understand how it happens, but we understand that happens. And interestingly not enough, we are also know that if you take an adult, stem, uh, uh, adult st cell, we can actually convert it into a stem cell. So this gives us the hope of taking an adult cell, converting it into a stem cell, and if we can only um, make that stem cell evolve into a kind of cell that we want, then we have the hope of addressing a lot of different diseases and so on. So this is the, the grand vision uh, of why one would really want to understand the behavior of embryonic stem cells. So it turns out that the biologists already know that um, a, a em embryonic stem cell um, can reacts uh, to uh, certain kinds of signals. Um, in fact, uh, LIF, Chiron, and PD, um, two out of the three signals will uh, cause some reaction in the stem cell in terms of the genes and the expression of those genes. And so what we can do is we can um, look at the different combinations of two out of three signals and see how each of the genes in the stem cell react. And then what we can do is we, we basically, um, from what we see um, in the uh, uh, experimental observations, we can build this uh, graph where these are blue nodes are genes and these black nodes are the signals. And a black line shows a positive interaction between the genes and a red line shows an inhibitory uh, reaction. And it turns out that if you consider all the different nodes and lines and signaling uh, uh, signals as inputs, you have 10 to the 43 possible state machines. And when you, throw, when you talk to computer scientists, they're not daunted by 10 to the 43 state machines. Um, because we have, for instance, verification techniques like model checking and um, SAT solvers and so on that can easily handle large state spaces. So for computer scientists, this is, this is a great example of how can we actually reduce the search space or reduce the number of plausible state machines. If all we, all we had to do was find some constraints to reduce the, the number of, of possible state machines to just the plausible ones, then we actually have made some progress. And it turns out that at Microsoft Research, we built and invented a tool called Z3 or Z3, which is the, the best constraint solver in the world. And the computational biologists at Microsoft Research 
um, knew about this Z3 tool that our programming languages and verification uh, researchers built for completely other reasons and used Z3 to uh, constrain the 10 to the 43 possible state machines into the plausible ones. And what they used for their constraints were actually observations from real experiments that the biologists have done over the years. So you go through all the literature in biology, look at the experimental observations, and use those to constrain what state machines, if you will, are really plausible. And so in that, that's what they were able to do. And the, so the set of possible models was constrained by experimentally observed behaviors. And this set was used to make a large number of predictions, non-intuitive predictions, of the response of the network to genetic per perturbations. And then these predictions, which were done purely on these you know, uh, state, state machines, were experimentally validated with over 70% accuracy, which is unprecedented in this particular area of biology. Moreover, what they were able to show is that this state machine, if you will, on the, on the right is like the kernel, the minimal genes and interactions um, given the signals that I mentioned before that show up in all the plausible models. And this was the new discovery in biology. And this was what was uh, part of that nature paper. So they're using off-the-shelf computational techniques and tools to make new discoveries in biology. And so this is pretty exciting to me. And especially when <laughs> um, I am from the community, research community, that plays with tools like model checkers and theorem provers and constraint solvers. And we hardly you know, invent these things thinking that we're going to discover biology in, in, the, in 20 years. So it's pretty, pretty exciting uh, for me to see this ap application of a constraint solver um, in, in such a pr profound way to biology. OK, so I argued, and just with one example, that one discipline, biology, has been influenced and is influencing many, um, uh, has been influenced by many computational methods, tools, techniques, and languages. But let me flip it around and say, and ask you, you know, what one computational method has been used by many different disciplines. This is the interactive part of the talk. <laughs> Don't be shy. Machine learning. So how, uh, you all have heard of machine learning, I'm sure. Uh, machine learning to me, and this is already years ago, has transformed the field of statistics. This is certainly true at Carnegie Mellon where we see the machine learning department as part of the School of Computer Science and the machine learning department is made up of faculty from the computer science department and faculty from the statistics department. In fact, they should be called the Department of Statistical Machine Learning. Um, and I can tell other stories about how I feel, why I feel machine learning has transformed statistics, but I'm not going to focus on that. Machine learning in the sciences has already been able to be used in astronomy to d make new discoveries like uh, brown dwarfs and fossil galaxies. It's used in medicine um, to detect uh, uh, tumors in, in mammograms. It's used in meteorolo meteorology for understanding tornado formation. It's used in the neurosciences where you um, apply it to a multitude of fMRI scans to understand what part of your brain lights up when you're looking at a verb versus looking at a noun. Um, the story I wanted to tell is also from Microsoft Research, uh, a, a, a different science group, where the aha it's also a biology story, so this is machine learning and biology. 
where the aha is um, that we have been using machine learning for many years to fight spam. And in fact, this very research group I'm talking about invented a machine learning algorithm originally to fight spam. It turns out that the, so the computational thinking idea here is, well, um, spammers mute messages to work around filters. So the solution to that is go after the weak, weak link. Now here's the aha. Um, can we use machine learning to fight HIV in the way that we can fight spam? And the a analogy is that HIV mutates to avoid attack by the immune system. So the solution is go after the weak link. And what's so amazing, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, is that the techniques that I'm going to talk about um, actually are able, and right now I'm talking about ongoing work in Microsoft Research, um, are able to understand um, vulnerable regions, the weak link, weak links in HIV. So the strategy is to identify what are called vulnerable regions in HIV. And then, if we can identify these vulnerable regions, we can create a vaccine that directs, that teaches the immune system to target just those regions. And the reason this is important is as follows. This HIV protein is made up of, is made up of basically of a string of amino acids that fold over each other in 3D. And what happens when um, the immune system attacks this protein it, if it, it, the protein is robust to, uh, in many places to attack, it just mutates, and it still retains the functionality that is so destructive to humans. And so you poke it, and it mutates, and it's still bad for humans. It, but there are places that, um, that perhaps, uh, for instance, in this place I'm showing here where the two loops intersect or are next to each other, where um, that's called a vulnerable region because that's where um, if, if, if the immune system attacks just at that point, the um, protein will, the HIV uh, protein will, will, will not mutate um, in a way that the um, uh, immune system, uh, it will not mutate so that uh, it will, um, weaken the, the it will, uh, so it will not, it will, will weaken the functionality of um, the destroying the human. So, so then how do we find these vulnerable regions? That's the question. And what the, so what uh, the researchers at Microsoft did in collaboration with researchers at Harvard is to realize that in the world, there are some people who are called controllers who have the HIV virus but don't get sick. And then there are the normal people who have the HIV virus but do get sick. And so what you can do is you can look for differences between where the immune systems of the controllers attack HIV versus where the immune systems of the normal people attack HIV. And you can use lots and lots of data to, to um, help you look for these differences. And what these researchers did was to actually use pretty much mach machine learning techniques to identify these vulnerable, reg uh, vulnerable regions. And they were able to identify eight regions of HIV proteins where controllers were much more likely to attack. So, that was step one, and that was tantalizingly um, uh, tantalizing to the researchers. And in fact, they went further to find more vulnerable regions. They used in silico prediction um, under certain uh, assumptions uh, and using the protein database that's been generated by the biology community to run high energy simulations and then using this fold X algorithm uh, we're able to actually identify many more regions um, 
as noted here. So these regions here are also new candidates of vulnerable regions. So the idea then is going back to the computational thinking is that uh, finding the weak link in spammer, spam was the metaphor for finding the weak link in HIV. Okay, so machine learning is everywhere, not just in uh, the sciences. The machine learning is, of course, used for detecting credit card spam. It's used on Wall Street for good or bad. It's used in supermarkets where you get, recommend, uh, you get coupons when you check out based on your previous buying patterns. It's used in all these recommendation systems uh, that you might be familiar with um, when you're going shopping or watching movies. And it's even used in sports. So right now there are, are uh, people who are actually getting funding from s professional sports agencies to use machine learning and data analytics to um, understand how best to train and coach their athletes. Computational thinking, of course, goes beyond just the sciences, even though that's the theme of this um, faculty summit. And I just wanted to hint at a couple of those examples. Um, computational thinking in, in the sciences, in chemistry, physics, and ge the geosciences, but what, and in math and engineering. But what I really wanted to get to is computational thinking beyond the sciences, where it's affecting disciplines that are more social, behavioral, uh, in nature. So in economics, for instance, um, in law and in healthcare. And the two examples I want to give, again, for Microsoft Research um, have to do with uh, computational thinking in economics and computational thinking in the social sciences. So the one on, um, in economics has to do with polling. So here I'm going to talk about the difference between what's called representative polling um, and non-representative polling. In, in, um, it, for instance, in the United States, when we have a presidential election, um, normally professional polling companies use what's called representative sampling, where you take a representation, or you take a sampling of the U.S. population, hoping that you're getting a representati representative sample, um, and to, to be able to predict the winner of the election. And that's an, a, a billion dollar business. The 2012 presidential election cost one polling, or uh, the professional polling companies over six billion dollars um, over the course of two years. And so the question is, does this sampling, this representative sampling polling method actually give you um, a good prediction of who's going to win the election? And some researchers at Microsoft Research had a co took a completely different approach. Um, it's cheaper, faster, and more accurate. And counterintuitively, it's based on this notion of non-representative sampling. And here, they actually polled Xbox users um, over a period of 45 days, um, got many, many more respondents than you would typically get in a representative sampling. Um, and for each respondent, they were able to collect information about the age, the gender, the race, the education level, and so on. And what they were able to do is collect a lot of data. And let me show you the data first, because it's collecting the data is just the first step. So. Here's the, uh, the election in 2012 was Obama versus Romney. And you'll notice that this dotted line, that straight dotted line that goes across is the final election outcome where Obama was won. And the professional pollers um, over time in this 45-day 40 uh, day period, um, you can see that that's that thick dotted line. Um, and they underestimated the um, final election outcome. And the raw Xbox data that was collected from the players of Xbox, um, that's the raw data, this red line. And actually, it doesn't look very good, does it? And the reason is, of course, uh, this is just data. What you really need to do is analyze the data, appro data appropriately so that it is indicative of what, what, how people actually will vote. 
And the way they do this is through a technique called post-stratification. So the idea is to take an individual and, for instance, if the individual in, in a representative poll might say um, a man from New York, so this is a man from New York, um, but in this particular post-stratification, what you do is you, you consider this man from New York, you, you label the per the, the, this individual as a man, so, and then also a person from New York. And so then you have m many more bins um, in which you can correlate the different combinations of men and age and gender and so on, uh, and then um, aggregate the properties to come up with what would be a representation of uh, the voters uh, in an election. And so it, it is through that post-stratification process that you can um, uh, uh, um, accommodate the fact that your original input is based on a non-representation, non-representative sampling of the population. And by the way, you should realize that most like 95 of percent of Xbox users are male, um, and they're between the age of like 19 and 29. So it is very much a non-representative sampling. But there were enough women over 65 um, that they could actually um, uh, get some information, get some signal out of those particular respondents. And so after you do this kind of data analysis based on the collection based on the data collection, then here's what they were able to predict. And so the uh, corrected Xbox, uh, that's the, the post-stratification using also multi-regression and so on, um, line is the one in the thick red line here. And you can see near towards the end of, n near the um, voting date, they were pretty much spot on in who was going to win. And they did better than the $6.4 billion worth of polling that had occurred um, for two years before the election date. This was, of course, very, uh, just one example of using this particular technique um, for predicting who's going to win the, the presidential election. And that many other uh, examples since then this team has done and for instance in uh, the World Cup um, in uh, uh, Oscar ceremonies that's the uh, Hollywood uh, awards that are given out every year um, and so on and right now if you're very very interested in this you can go to what's called the Microsoft prediction lab and that's actually a website and uh, you yourself can participate in these kinds of polls and surveys. The last point I wanted to make mention about this kind of work is it's also very important um, to be clear about uh, what kind of question you actually ask the people you're polling. So it, it turns out that, for instance, it's you get a better prediction if you ask the question, instead of asking the question, who are you going to vote for, if you ask the question, who do you think will win? And that's why this particular team also uses data, not just by asking questions of individuals, but looking at data from Twitter, data from betting uh, pools, and so on. So in fact, it's multiple data sources that this Microsoft Prediction Lab uses in order to do their kinds of predictions. OK, so that was computational thinking in economics. Uh, computational thinking, as I've mentioned, uh, beyond the sciences also has uh, had uh, uh, influence in archaeology. There was e an eHeritage project that started in Microsoft Research Asia here many years ago, and I'm still gone going. Um, there's uh, many programs now in the United States on computational journalism, master's level programs, digital journalism, um, in fact, at Columbia University, the School of Journalism just hired uh, a couple of new faculty members, and they were PhDs in computer science. Um, in the humanities, it's a lot of it is based on big data and digging into data and understanding patterns across different disciplines, but also just within a discipline. 
uh, in history and literature and so on. The example I want to give you is again from Microsoft Research having to do with um, the combination of computational uh, co computer science and anthropology and learning about crowd workers. So in this um, work, the researcher uh, for Microsoft Research and her colleagues um, use uh, digital studies to basically produce graphs, nodes and, and relationships in the nodes, and then use, uses anthropology to understand the kinds of relations, um, the kinds of nodes. And in this particular work that I'm s um, going to describe to you, what, was what they wanted to study was what is the economic model, the incentive and reward structure for crowd workers, you know. And what they concluded was that the economic model for understanding crowd workers is not the perfect com competition model, which is what um, most of our economy is based on. In the perfect competition model, there's a law called law of one pricing, where equal pay is given for equal jobs. So if you do the same job, you're, you, know, you get the same pay. It turns out that in this study, that perfect, the perfect competition um, model do doesn't hold. In fact, the, what's called the imperfect competition model holds, where the law of one pricing does not hold. In this particular case, um, different Amazon mechanical turkers might be doing the same job, but actually get paid differently. And so it was in studying and mapping the crowd and looking at some of the commonalities of where the crowd workers are, for instance, internet access, um, and so on, that allowed them to hypothesize that the imperfect competition model better explains um, the, the economic model for how crowd working works. And then the, the study I'm citing goes on to suggest different policy recommendations for um, addressing this imperfect competition. So now let me turn to education. And I wanted to say that I said this already, that at the undergraduate level, at the graduate level, we're already seeing a lot of progress in computational thinking. Uh, I think the real challenge is the K through 12 level. Uh, and we talked, uh, uh, Han mentioned earlier about the pipeline going uh, into the earlier stages of the pipeline. I think if we can do that, we'll see a very different society in the future. So I've asked the question of the computer science community, um, what is an effective way of learning and, or teaching computational thinking by or to the K through 12 space? And I think there are, the, my analogy is, is to mathematics. You know, somehow by the time you're in five years old in kindergarten, you have a sense of number. Uh, and by the time you're 12 years old or in seventh grade, um, you have mathematical sophistication enough to learn algebra. And by the time you're 18 years old or uh, in 12th grade, you have the concepts behind you and the mathematical sophistication to learn calculus. So what's the analogy in computer science? You know, when is the right time to learn or teach recursion? Um, you know, I, or maybe there are these inherent concepts that we're born with, innate concepts that we're born with. Um, those are a actually research questions. So, and then there's of course the, the challenge of how do we best integrate the computer, the device, in teaching these concepts. And one of the concerns I have with MOOCs is that we're just throwing technology at something. How do we know that this is actually improving and enhancing our learning? Okay, but what I wanted to do is, um, well, here's my short example of computational thinking in, in daily life. So, and then I'll talk about the progress we've made around the world in education. So here is me uh, at, uh, this is actually me at the, at the National Science Foundation cafeteria on my second day. And what I do is I get a cup and then I put some milk in it and then some coffee and then I put some sugar in and then I 
put a lid on, get a napkin, and leave. So, you know, as a computer scientist, I look at this coffee station and I, I say, well, what's wrong with this coffee station? What's wrong with this coffee station? Let me give you a hint. It's even worse when there's, like, someone in your way. So as a computer scientist, what, what do I think or what do you think? What's the concept that's going to help me s make this, cof this coffee station more efficient? Well, I think pipelining. Um, so, and then I actually think, oh, well, um, what are the minimum stations I need to move to affect a pipeline? Is actually, actually the most efficient pipeline and blah, 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 blah. Um, but of course, I'm just at the cafeteria. So, in fact, if you think about it, you just need to move the lids over and it's, it's not the most efficient pipeline, but it, it cer certainly helps. So this is just an example of computational thinking in daily life. It's not that there's a hard, difficult problem that you're trying to solve, but it's a way that you bring in the concepts you've learned um, in computer science to approaching, uh, you know, daily routine activities. Okay, so now let me talk about the efforts in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and China having to do with computational thinking. And in the United States, this is a busy slide, but let me just focus on two, um, two efforts. The, the biggest effort that's happening in the United States is a revamping of the advanced placement computer science course that is offered to high school students. And this has been ongoing since about 2009. Um, and the hope is that, the, the, the plan is that this new AP class in computer science is actually going to teach fundamental principles of, of computer science, not just programming in your favorite programming language. And the reason this is such an important leverage in the United States is that in the United States, to affect any change at the K through 12 level means actually going to 10,000 school districts one by one and trying to affect the change. Because in the United States, the public school system at the K through 12 level is completely decentralized. And so the one lever we have is the, these AP classes and the AP tests that high school students like to take in order to, to get credit, get college credit when they enter a college. And so if we can capture that one point, that attention of theirs, then we can affect some, some, we have some amount of, you know, ability to change um, high school curriculum in a more, um, in a simpler way than going to, to school district one by one. And so that's been ongoing. And th at the same time, not only do you want this high school course to change, but you also need the freshman level college course to change because you're supposed to be getting college credit for that course. And so fortunately, as this change in the advanced placement curricula has been ongoing, so have changes across many colleges and universities in the United States in terms of adding or changing a course at the freshman level, specifically for non-majors, but often not even for majors as well, and it's basically computer science concepts for, for non-majors. And many, many classes now are, um, are many, many campuses now are changing their freshman level course to um, be more about computational concepts and not computer programming. In fact, the, one of the most popular courses at Harvard University is exactly this course. Uh, now, part of that is due to the, uh, the instructor who is very popular. But the, the, the students do vote with their feet. So that is what's going on in the U.S. The kind of parallel efforts in changing the high school curriculum for computer science and the undergraduate freshman level curriculum, especially for non-majors. Um, I'm really impressed with what the United Kingdom has done. Uh, and this started uh, already in 2012. It went in January 2012, this report from the British Royal Society came out called Shut Down or Restart. And it acknowledged the importance of computational thinking, but more importantly, um, they already had in the UK a required computing course. And that required computing course was really about 
com computing skills, um, l learning Word and Excel and so on. Um, so fortunately, there was already room in the K through 12 curriculum. And what, what has happened uh, since 2012 is replacing the content of that required computing course with honest to goodness content about computer science. And so very, very excited about this. Um, computing at school is, school in the UK is K through 12 in the US. Um, there, there's an effort uh, that, that started since 2012. Um, it's really a grassroots effort. And I'm really proud to say that uh, one of the persons behind this effort was a Microsoft researcher at Cambridge, Simon Peyton Jones. And this fall, 2014, is the first rollout of a K through 12 curricula, curricula for, uh, that includes computational thinking, um, teaching computational thinking concepts at each grade level. So there's a spelled out uh, curriculum uh, for each level. And uh, right now, they're, they're, they're making it happen. Uh, and this is just, just for England now. So this is pretty, ex it's experimental, it's pretty exciting, it's pretty new, um, and we'll see what happens. But the UK was really, of all the countries around the world, was really the, the gutsy lead on this. So what about um, in other countries? Well, I wanted to really focus on what's happening in China. So uh, I guess that's me on a boat after the faculty summit in Seattle, <laughs> uh, talking to Professor Guoliang Shen, who was the key influencer of computational thinking in China. And he was the one who started the first computer science fundamental course of computational thinking. And what has happened since uh, then is, in 2012, the Chinese Ministry of Education, the MOE, announced a program to reform the computing fundamental courses focusing on computational thinking. And why this is important is at the time, the, this particular course that was offered um, had, had a couple of problems. One was that in some places, what that co course covered was, was trying to cover too much. It covered computer history, uh, languages, operating systems, it's kind of throwing it all into one course. And people really didn't get a, um, a deep understanding of some of the concepts. In other variations of this course, it really was about teaching um, computer skills, like using Word and PowerPoint and Excel and so on. And so either, uh, and many students would take that course and be really bored because they knew this stuff already. And they didn't s understand the value of, uh, and the, th they didn't get the appreciation of the depth of computer science as a field. So in any case, the, the other thing that, so, that, so this is happening right, right now um, in just as I speak, um, with Microsoft Research Asia's participation, um, the, uh, we and the MOE are jointly putting forward a program to sponsor 16 full computational thinking courses and 100 case studies. And the proposals are, are due pretty soon, or maybe they're in already, and 16 will be chosen. And micro so this, is, this really shows the lead of Microsoft Res Research Asia in helping uh, revamp the college curriculum in uh, China. Um, and so the hope is to empower 7 million students with computational thinking ability through these CS fundamental courses. Okay, so I'm, I will stop there. My little three-page article was translated into Chinese and, and into French. So you can actually read, read uh, the article in in, in Chinese if you want. So I will uh, just uh, uh, help, uh, help me spread the uh, computational thinking um, and help me make computational thinking commonplace. That's my, my plea to you. Thank you.